Thank you so much, Yuning. Um, you can see my slides? Uh, yes. Awesome. Well, thank you for the introduction. Super excited to be here. It was already a, a very exciting morning. Thanks, Carl, for your talk. Um, and, and let me get started. So today I'm going to be talking about some of the challenges and solutions for deploying AV as a platform at an enormous scale. There's many interesting challenges when you encounter as you start thinking about how to deploy a hardware software solution that has to scale across many different use cases from active safety all the way to L4. It has to scale across different types of vehicles from consumer vehicles to trucks, buses, robo taxis, and even specialized vehicles like tractors. Um, you have to scale across different manufacturers and you have to scale all over the world. So that really is the focus of my talk. How do you deal with, how do you think about reason about scaling like this and how do you deal with the complexity there? So in the next half hour, I'll talk about some of these interesting challenges, some of the solutions that we see, and I'll wrap up a little bit by talking about the central role of simulation in training, testing, and validation. So developing a robust AV solution requires dealing with several different pieces from data acquisition, model training, to deployment and testing. And all of these are areas that we're heavily invested in and providing solutions for. Um, the thing that I find most exciting and challenging here is all of this needs to operate at this massive scale. So as an example, NVIDIA announced a partnership with Mercedes last year to build the world's leading platform for AV functionality in consumer cars. So starting in 2024, every next generation Mercedes vehicle will include this architecture, um, the NVIDIA hardware, software, and AI to be able to autonomously drive. And this functionality includes um, very basic um, active safety functionality, but then it also sort of includes driving um, autonomously from address to address on regular routes. It includes level four parking, many other things. And all of this capability has to keep improving over the life of the vehicle. We're developing this technology um, with Mercedes, but really this is an open platform that's available to other partners as well. So now when you start thinking about the scale of this, right, we're enabling large amounts of AV functionality from active safety all the way up to level four on millions of consumer cars, on multiple vendors all over the world. Uh, what are the sorts of challenges that you would face? Let's talk about those. So I'll start off by talking about um, all the functionality you need to develop here. So the very basic stuff, which is available in most cars is active safety. So this is functionality like automatic braking and steering assist, it's lane keeping, blind spot monitoring and so on. Next you have level two plus driving. So for example, uh, address to address urban driving where you have features that are either fully automated or they require human confirmation. These features include things like intersection handling. You have level three driving on highways where the vehicle is responsible for detecting the ODD, detecting and reacting safely to all issues without requiring immediate handover to the driver. And then you have complex level four driving where the vehicle not only parks or unparks, but can be summoned from a parking spot. It can have a trailer attached, you need to deal with that as well. And all of this functionality needs to be supported with a single stack, a single perception planning prediction stack. And that's what makes it challenging. Car manufacturers have been doing lane keeping automatic emergency braking, for example, forever. Um, but yet those have been done with very simple perception and planning. But when you want to run this functionality along with more complex urban driving, you want to leverage the same stack for all of this. Next, we have geography. Our partner vehicles will be sold, sold in over 100 countries all over the world. How do you figure out what is the mix of real world data that you should gather in each of these areas for both training and validation? Which areas are similar enough so that you can leverage data collected between them and which are more diverse and require targeted data collection? The diversity in the world comes from all sorts of different factors, from layouts of cities to the appearance of cars and other objects like traffic signs, um, to the rules of the road and even the behavior of the people inside them. Tackling this problem requires thinking smartly about how best to utilize your limited resources for data collection and labeling, and then how to leverage simulation. I'll talk a little bit about both these topics in this talk. Another thing we need to consider is this, this, this software and this hardware architecture have to scale to drastically different compute requirements. So you need to support everything from small ADAS computers that are only 10 tops and six watts all the way to full self driving that requires more than 2000 tops. You wanna be able to leverage your hardware and software architecture as much as possible between all of these vehicles because otherwise you end up having to maintain several different architectures and stacks and that becomes very expensive. 
Similar to the compute and software stack, we also want to define a common sensor stack for all vehicles, and that has to be capable of scaling to different, um, different ODDs and, and different capabilities. So for example, here we have the level two and level three sensor configurations that we're using, and both of them have cameras, radar, ultrasonics mounted all over the car, and they're very, very similar. But then the L3 version of the sensor stack has to have some extra capability. So for example, it has more forward sensing capability using stereo vision and LIDAR in order to deal with things like debris at high speeds. Having a common sensor stack means having the same sensors in roughly the same locations for all partners that are using this platform. Um, on the development side, that helps us validate our algorithms once, build and validate them once, and deploy across everyone. It also helps leverage common work like sensor tuning, ISP tuning, drivers, and so forth. So we're building this platform to enable all the different partners that we have, but we want to minimize the amount of work that it takes to enable every partner. I already talked about having a common compute stack and sensor stack, but there's much more. You also need to have a common vehicle abstraction layer. So basically an abstraction between our software and the manufacturer low-level software that does controls. We develop our common stack on a reference of fleet vehicles um, that encompass different types of vehicles like the coupe, the sedan, an SUV, and so forth. We test our software on these reference vehicles in both simulation and the real world. And then every additional manufacturer vehicle that comes up, we first test it in simulation using a vehicle dynamics model that the manufacturer provides, and then we test it on road. And that really minimizes the amount of um, vendor specific testing that needs to go in. So I've been talking about how to create a common set of advanced AV functionality for all car manufacturers, but you still want different car manufacturers to have the ability to customize their cars and make them unique. There's several ways that you can make this happen from visualization changes to changes in how the HMI works, all the way to how the car feels when driving. The feeling of driving a Mercedes, for example, is very different from driving a Mustang. The interesting challenge here is that you want to write a common control stack for deploying on many different types of vehicles and manufacturers and to enable this change of the feel of the vehicle from something smooth to something sporty with just changing some knobs or parameters. And of course, all this functionality has to be enabled inside constraints. Consumer cars, for example, have very tight constraints on the amount of space, the power, the thermal budget, and the cost. And all of this functionality running on all of this constrained architecture needs a lot of compute, right? So there's a lot of things that we need to be doing in order to enable everything from active safety to something like level four parking. Here's just some examples uh, of the types of networks that we're running. So for example, we have to do a very simple, just you know, basic object detection in cameras and LIDAR and radar using DNNs. But then there's more complex stuff. We need to estimate distance to things. We need to estimate what are your paths, especially when there's no maps. Uh, figure out what are intersections, you need to understand what the, the human inside the car is doing so that you can monitor whether they're distracted or not. Um, you need to find parking spots, many other things. And that's just on perception. You still have the planning and control stack that needs to do, again, very simple stuff like ACC and lane key plane assist, but it also needs to do much more complex stuff like intersection handling, dealing with very congested traffic, and so forth. So a lot of advanced planning maneuvers, um, some of what I talked about, require HD maps. And that's a vital component for self-driving technology. You can do some things without a map, but much more functionality is enabled once you have a map. Um, so for example, you know precisely where you are on the road, which lane you're in, um, how to navigate an intersection and so forth. And HD maps are something that the level four robotaxi community, for example, just takes for granted. However, when you're launching a product on consumer vehicles all over the world, you can't guarantee HD maps everywhere. And in addition, there are several areas where survey cars can't even go, like private driveways and parking lots. So how do you get around this problem? At NVIDIA, we have a concept of my route maps. So basically, as a commuter, there are some routes that you travel frequently, like your daily commute or your school carpool route or your drive to Whole Foods. And we generate personalized maps for you on these routes. By running perception landmark detection in real time on your drives, we can generate a map automatically, fuse it with previous drives on the same roads, and automatically generate a high quality HD map that then we can use to enable extra functionality. With user cons consent, we can also transmit this map to the server, aggregate user data, and share that map with the entire fleet. So that shortly after the launch of a new vehicle in an area, you can start to generate automatic crowdsource maps for these locations. 
And this same process can then also be used to keep the map fresh. We can dynamically update a map when any vehicle in an OEM fleet drives the same route and it has changed. So let me show you a little bit of how this works. On any given drive, we use perception semantic output and ego motion to create a version of the map. It's called map stream here. Map streams contain information like the lane and road boundaries, signs, traffic lights, road markings, radar data, so forth. Streams from multiple map streams can be registered, fused together, and then you create a, a final map that you drive on. So here's just a very basic drive. We're driving this route for the first time. We're generating all of this data that can be useful in a map and for localization. So for example, we've got ladder lane lines, road boundaries, we've got traffic signs up ahead, um, we've got poles, vertical geometry. And then if you fuse together multiple of these, you get an automatically generated map. And so you can see here all of the semantics. You know, it's a very consistent lane boundaries, road geometry. There are lanes that are not complete because we never drove there. But for the most part, you can see um, there is a lot of useful data. And then there is also this radar data that you can use for localization. So here's a video of showing the quality of that map that is generated and the quality of the localization. We're driving a route that we created automatically and then we're reprojecting these map elements that I talked about, like signs and lane boundaries back into the image here. And then here we have um, the same, we have a route that we generated a map for automatically. If we can enable autonomous driving functionality on that, on that map. Okay, so let's switch topics a bit and talk about data. When we're driving at a massive scale all over the world, we're regularly dealing with petabytes of data. How do we utilize this data to best train our networks? Ideally, we want to pick images that would best help train our networks. And what we want to do is pick images where the networks are the most uncertain. And this uncertainty can occur because of many reasons like noise and observations, incomplete coverage of the domain or imperfect models. The accuracy of a network is not the same as uncertainty. You have to have an accurate output, or you can have an accurate output, but with a large amount of uncertainty. So how do you predict the uncertainty of a sample? Um, I'll, I'll cover one technique, and there's so many ways of doing this. Um, but basically, you, you need to have some way. Otherwise, you're going to be left with massive amounts of data and no good way of curating it. Um, so, so if you're looking for the uncertainty of a sample, Bayesian networks are a very principled way of modeling it, but they're expensive. The cheaper way to model uncertainty is to use an ensemble of networks. So the basic idea is really simple. You can train an ensemble of networks, for example, using different seeds, and we can sample from their output and quantify the uncertainty of the model on new unlabeled samples. And we basically label the samples where the model has the most uncertainty. This framework is pretty straightforward for a classification task, but how do we generalize it to detection? So basically to extend this approach to detection, you can partition the image into cells and then use the disagreement of the output of the ensemble at each cell in order to measure the uncertainty. You can visualize this as a heat map. So here, for example, we've got this image. Here's a trailer that we, we haven't seen a lot of before, pretty, pretty uncertain about it. When you plot the uncertainty here, there's pretty high, high uncertainty. And the idea would be you sample images where you have such, such examples of uncertainty. Okay, so I want to switch gears a little bit again and talk about simulation. Simulation helps us support the entire development and validation process from start to finish. This includes perception development, planning and control development and testing, full AV stack validation, integration testing, and full virtual vehicle testing. So for example, for testing human machine interface. The benefit of simulation is that we can test all sorts of scenarios from all sorts of lighting and weather to scene setup, traffic patterns to the long tail of appearance and events. And just as importantly, the ground truth is free. We know all the attributes of the world around us from the exact 3D envelopes of each object to their velocities, their trajectories, and the semantics of everything in the world. We use simulation across several different use cases, but in the rest of my talk, I'll focus on the use case of end-to-end -end simulation and synthetic data generation for perception. Training and testing in simulation is hard for several reasons. You need simulation to accurately reflect the world we're trying to replicate from sensors to the content to the behavior of other actors. 
we need simulation to be reproducible and we need it to be able to run reasonably fast, ideally interactively. I'm not going to talk about all of these challenges, but let's talk about a couple. First off, simulation just looks different from the real world, and there's two large contributors to this, an appearance gap and a content gap. The appearance gap has to do with the returns for a simulated sensor not matching those of a real sensor given the same scene. This can be the result of differences in object details and materials, the physical simulation of the world, or the simulation of the sensor itself. We are showing camera images here, but the appearance gap extends to simulation with LiDAR and radar as well. The content gap can be thought of as everything else that is different between these two beams. This includes factors like the number of objects in the scene, their diversity, the type of placement, and other contextual information. In order to close the content and uh, appearance gap, the first thing we do is look at the quality of a renderer. So here I'm showing the results of rendering with our renderer. And this is the easiest way of closing this gap. We basically model the appearance of the world as realistically as possible. Instead of relying on a game engine with a renderer that has approximations, we model light transport with ray tracing and material properties in a physically accurate way. As a result, the image quality is absolutely unsurpassed compared to any other synthetic data approaches. And this sort of approach is applicable not just to cameras, but to all the sensors that we're, we're rendering. Basically, LiDAR, radar, camera, for all of them, we need to be able to match the, the physics of the world, the, the light transport or the transport of um, uh, radar frequency, and we need to be able to match the, the, the surfaces and the materials in a physically realistic way. Um, Omniverse, the, the renderer that we're using here, supports fast real-time rendering as well as a physically accurate path trace mode. During runtime, we will typically use a faster real-time mode, but synthetic data generation can make use of either the RTX renderer or a full path trace mode. So that's, that's one way of, of uh, uh, closing the gap on appearance, but there's other ways as well. So you can use domain randomization and, uh, and many other techniques. So, so here's an example of just sort of uh, creating a simulated scene and then randomizing it with much more synthetic data. So for example, we can augment it with scene lighting, fog, image saturation, bloom effects, and so forth. I mentioned at the beginning of the talk that AVs need to be deployed all over the world. An important component of the testing we need to do then is to validate our stack and run in all these unique environments. It starts with needing to have a really good map. Maps are an important component for realistic generation of scenarios for testing. For example, complex many-way interaction intersections that we might see in the real world. They're also important for creating the proper context for perception. So for example, when you have occlusions due to road curvature. Map data and simulation can come from maps that we are creating from the real world on our vehicle. So for example, I talked about how we're creating these MyRoute maps. You can then import any such map directly into simulation, or you can build it from aerial or scanned map data, and this data can be imported. Or you can even generate this um, map data completely procedurally. So for example, we can have generative models that create realistic road layouts, and even more, we can make them conditional. So you can create a synthetic hybrid testing environment where part of the scene looks like Cambridge, another part looks like New York. This can be framed as a graph generation problem. Um, so I'll say there's much more work on this. I'm, I'm talking about one specific area that um, colleagues are looking at at NVIDIA. Um, so, so when you're framing it as a graph generation problem, you're basically saying the nodes are the control points on the roads and straight road segments can connect nodes. And then you, you're generating this graph using a RNN but with attributes. So control points need to have things like the X, Y location of where they are in the city. So let's show a, a quick example of how this works. So here we're conditioning on different cities and you can learn the style of how cities are laid out. And that's pretty authentic when you compare it to real open street map data. You can also create a map where you have certain road elements that you, you, um, you anchor basically, and then you generate the rest of the map around it. And you can use this sort of technique for parsing uh, aerial imaging so that you can use this as a prior for estimating world geometry. And then once you've got these maps that you've generated either for a from aerial images or completely procedurally, you can start procedurally generating many more things like vegetation and buildings and other elements and so forth in order to have maps now that are, are reflecting the sorts of conditions that we want to be testing, like you know, testing in India or testing in Japan, even without having gone there. 
So I just talked about testing in different parts of the world. Um, and, and in order to enable something like that, right? Like how do I test that my, my algorithm is going to work equally well in India or Japan if I'm only driving my vehicles today in you know, like some part of the US? Um, and some part of it, of the story is the maps, but an equally other important part is um, having the right objects to place in our scenes. So 3D objects, 3D assets are expensive and time consuming, and we're going to hinder our ability to train and test our software stack all over the world, for example, or in very different conditions if we are um, overfitting to these very few assets that we have access to. There's been a lot of work on creating assets directly from images, and I think this is a really exciting area of research. So basically, if we can go from an image to a 3D model, we can replicate all the diversity we would see in the real world, um, which can, you know, which can be captured with just a, a specific sensor uh, from, from just any sensor. For example, you can capture all of this diversity from a dash cam, or you can capture it from somebody's iPhone. You don't need to have your specific sensor set on your vehicles driving in the world. So you can now test, for example, the diversity of cars, trucks, and rickshaws in India just by getting consumer photos and creating assets um, that you then populate into your simulation. So how would you go about doing something like this? In graphics, we know that images are formed by the interaction of geometry and light. So you have a mesh and lights and materials input to a renderer that then generates an output image. There's been a lot of work on making these renderers differentiable. And with that, suddenly this whole rendering pipeline becomes amenable to deep learning. So you can have an input image or a set of images that goes through some neural network that's going to predict these graphics parameters. And now through the renderer, you can produce a rendered image and you can create a loss between that rendered image and your actual input image. With a differentiable renderer, you can then backprop gradients directly and train this whole stack. Um, idea being, right, like I, I have my image from a dash cam of a, of a car in India, and I want to be able to create um, 3D assets that, that accurately model this. So this almost works, but I'm going to gloss over some much more, uh, more involved details here. Basically, if you train something like this, uh, you need additional complexity in order to get good results because you need to be able to have uh, multi-view geometry. Right? You need to be able to have images of the same object from multiple angles. And this sort of defeats our initial premise because I wanted to create 3D reconstructions from uncontrolled input data, for example, a dash cam or someone's iPhone. In order to solve this problem, you can exploit GANs as a multi-view generator. I'm not going to talk about the details, but they are in the paper that, that is linked here. Um, but basically, the result of this is pretty impressive, right? Like you can go from input images on the left um, to synthesize data on the right. The 3D geometry we're rendering here from both the same view as the input image, but from many other views. The implications are basically that you can create 3D data to easy, easily replicate scenes that you've captured with your own sensor stack, and then recreate, for example, scenes that your AV stack had trouble with in the past, and recreate them entirely in simulation so that you can test in closed loop improvements that you're making, either in your perception or planning and so forth. Even more excitingly, you can create representative 3D content for regions where you don't have any data just by using cheap consumer content from any off-the-shelf device like a dash cam or a phone. Like I mentioned, simulation is useful not just for testing and validation, but we also use it for quickly bringing up a new sensor or algorithm before we have any on-vehicle time. A network trained on just simulated data is not going to do that well in the real world, but it is a huge advantage to be able to train and create a whole pipeline in simulation in advance of when real data becomes available. As real data starts to come in, you can then balance the amount of data that you're using from simulation versus the real world. So as an example, we recently brought up new fisheye cameras from our census set, and we wanted to test out using these cameras for parking. Before we had any vehicles with fisheye cameras mounted, we were able to train and test our parking end-to-end -end with object detection running on our simulator and with the object detector trained entirely on synthetic fisheye lens camera, <coughs> camera data. As soon as we had a vehicle with sensors integrated, we were then able to immediately start testing our end-to-end -end parking system, while in parallel, we start gathering data to train better networks. This ability to train and test entirely in simulation means you significantly cut down on the time it takes to bring up new end-to-end -end functionality. And then, even when you have enough real-world data, you can still use simulation to generate data for specific failure cases. 
So for example, um, here's, here's an example of a network that was having trouble detecting truncated large trucks that were very close to us. So one way of, uh, of solving for this easily is you find this failure event, you generate massive amounts of similar data in simulation, you retrain with some of this data added in, and you solve your problem. And that ends my talk. I'm super excited about the revolution in autonomous driving and its positive implications on safety and quality of life for people all over the world. The scale of this revolution is massive. And I hope I got you excited about some of the challenges and thinking about some of the solutions for developing and deploying at this sort of scale. Thank you.